There we go. Uh, we are live. Uh, welcome everyone to tonight's episode of Profound States with your guest Charles Michael Mike Beaver. Uh, I still don't have my. Uh, I don't have my lighting set really well. Let's change it a tiny bit if we can. Take two. Well, it it looks actually pretty good, but there we go. There, well, no, it's not the it's not the, there. That's better. Uh, all right. We could take two, but this is good. It's fine. Um, Welcome to tonight's episode of Profound States. Tonight we have, oh, now that's bright. Oh, that's the white. Okay, I got to do it. Tonight we have Kathy J. Forty, PhD. She was born in Chicago, Illinois. She is a clinical psychologist with over 30 years of experience in the mental health field, working with individuals and families from all, all cultures and backgrounds. She received her doctorate and master's degree in counseling psychology from Old Dominion, Univer Dominion University in Virginia and has trained hundreds of therapists in techniques such as trauma, neurofeedback, and energy medicine. She is author of, to the fictional series Stacks Library of Truth and also um, her own personal story, Fractals of God, a psychologist's near-death experience and journeys into the mystical. She is a teacher, blogger, and lecturer. She leads Awakening and healing the soul journeys to Egypt each year, which focus on the ancient healing practices used in the Egyptian mystery schools. As a direct result of her near-death experience uh, in 2003, Dr. Forty brought back information which led to the development of the Trinfinity 8 and Ascension 11 energetic healing software systems. Her webs One of her websites is Infinite 8, uh, uh, Trinfinity 8. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it is wrong. It's Trinfinity 8, T R I N F I N I T Y 8.com. Uh, I've got her <laughs> cell phone number I'm not giving out, nor her Skype. Uh, welcome to tonight's show, uh, Kathy J. Forty. How are you? Doing? I am fine, Mike. Thanks. Kathy's fine. <laughs> uh, okay, so. Uh, I've given a long introduction. Do you have anything you want to add to the introduction? Uh, no, no, it's uh, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Nobody wants to know, uh, you know, if I can do a 20 page uh, Vita, you know, the, <laughs> of everything I've done. So th th I think that's sufficient for okay. now. So uh, I saw your your uh, interview on uh, Jeff Mara's show. He interviewed me a while back and and I saw yours uh, more recently, and um, I thought you were just an awesome guest, and uh, I thought Thank you would be a good person uh, for my show. So let me do one other thing here real quick. All right. So, um, so uh, I guess even before your NDE, uh, I'm sure long before that, you had interesting thing, things happen in your life. Did you uh, have anything interesting happen when you were a young lady? Um, yeah, you, you know, it's, I didn't know it then, but I used to think kind of profound thoughts back then. You know, they were kind of simple. Things like, is there anyone else in the world that feels just like me, like a parallel Kathy? You know, somewhere else in the world or dimension or cosmos and, you know, and I'm, uh, you know, who's thinking the thoughts I'm thinking right now, having the same experiences and so forth. And of course, I knew nothing about, you know, parallel worlds or any of those kind of concepts back then or the multi-universe. So, you know, as I got much older and, and learned more, I thought, wow, I, actually, that was pretty good for, you know, uh, a 10 year old to feel that way and, ask, and already be asking those questions. But, you know, the uh, the first really kind of profound experience I had um, that I would say, you know, compared to other stuff, I mean, we always had, I always had kind of intuitive stuff, but I wouldn't consider myself a psychic child growing up by any means compared to a lot of people. 
you know, I kind of had some intuition about stuff, but, you know, I didn't see beings or angels or I wasn't visited by, you know, any extraterrestrials or so forth like that. But at the age of 18, um, I was involved in uh, theater work in downtown Chicago. I was a you know, before I became a psychologist, I, I was doing theater work at uh, the Goodman Theater School of Drama, right next to the Art Institute. And uh, I was coming back from working on a play one night, and I was attacked. And um, as I was being attacked, I was raped. And as, as this was happening, I saw myself raise out of my body while the actual event was happening. And which I thought was kind of weird at the time. How come I'm looking down at this experience? Because I really hadn't had any knowledge of of uh, out of body experiences by then. And then something really interesting happened. It was as if um, I was afraid that he was going to use the weapon he had on me, and that was it. And I'd never see my my family or uh, my sister and brother again. And and just as all that energy uh, and emotion was rising in me, uh, there was like a theater, a screen, a big screen opened in my mind's eyes, and I saw myself in the future. And this future self was, uh, I could see the room I was in, I could see the colors on the walls, it was kind of a, a strange kind of green, and I could see an antique hutch, and I could see this black Chinese lacquered rocking chair, and I was sitting in it, and I was reading to two children a children's book. And I knew in that, and I looked older, much older, and since I was 18 at the time, and I realized in that moment that I was going to survive this this uh, this attack, and I was going to live to be an older room, a person, and and so this this total calm came over me, and I was able to kind of act it out as if I was a, you know, an actor in a play, and this wasn't really happening to me, and you know, I survived it. And many, many years later, when I walked into my husband-to-be's house, uh, there was the Chinese, black Chinese rocking chair. There was the hutch. There was the color on the walls, the same architecture and so forth. And I just stopped. And um, I did at that time um, afterwards, I did write some children's books. And that was the books I was reading to these faceless, two faceless children. And I realized, even though I'm no longer with that 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 ex-husband, um, that I was show, being shown a probable future. And the whole idea of that was just to know um, you're going to be OK, you're going to survive this and don't worry about dying. And so that kind of that experience, which I find a lot as a clinical psychologist, it tends to be. Um, sometimes abuse situations that open the psychic realm. Now, I had a no no history of abuse in my biological family growing up, whether it be sexual or emotional or physical or anything of that nature. I had a really great childhood, surprising compared to a lot of people. And so this was the first experience I'd ever had with that. And so um, it caused an opening in me because after that I started to become more... So certainly more intuitive. Um, and I started to kind of know certain things were going to happen, although it wasn't one of those things you're going to, you know, put your shingle out and do it as a profession. But I realized, especially much later, what had opened because of that trauma. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of a classic case that trauma does open up the extrasensory channels. And um, especially if you've had long-term abuse, you're, it's even more so because you're maybe living in a hypervigilant state. And uh, so, um, you know, clients that I work with over the years who'd had multiple abuse, sexual abuse and otherwise as a very young child and throughout their whole childhood, um, uh, many of them were raging psychics. So. And, you know, if you follow any of the mind control government uh, operations of the past, MKUltra and so forth, they would, um, this is how they got children to, um, to dissociate and, and open those psychic senses by um, instilling some type of abuse situation. So, you know, so they knew.
they knew what causes those abilities to open. So between that uh, glimpse into your future or a possible future and your near-death experience, did you have any other notable experiences between those two events? No. Um, it, uh, you know, just that, you know, I started working with very, very difficult clients when I became a psychologist. In fact, all of the real hard dissociative, multiple uh, personality disorders and so forth like that seemed to flock to me because, uh, you know, for some reason I seemed to be a natural at it and I got it and I kind of knew what to do. And uh, so, um, and I used, you know, sometimes I just knew what to, to do. I would just kind of go inside sometimes and go, I remember somebody coming to me and they had bugs coming out of different orifices and that was a first for me and you know out of their eyes and other places and i said to them what when did this start and they said oh i was having a drug experience and i was feeling so good i was doing mdma ecstasy and i you know felt so euphoric and i heard a voice in my head saying can i join you and she goes yeah sure that's cool and of course you know some some entity did join her and she couldn't get rid of him and back then i really didn't know how to deal with you know spiritual attacks and attachments you know i'm i'm much more a little bit more versed in that now but back then it was sort of like i don't know what to do with this case you know so uh i did know it was somebody who did perform what would be kind of spirit stuff and you know exorcisms and whatnot like that and so i just referred the case but i remember thinking wow you know drug experiences can open up a whole new pandora's box of stuff you don't want well okay so relatively speaking how many clients have you seen uh in your lifetime <laughs> relatively speaking th thousand ten thousand oh, thousands yeah thousands. i, I, yeah, I because, you know, some of them are more long term and reoccurring and so forth like that. So, and yeah. How, yeah. How big a percentage had attaching spirits? Um, well, many? we never got into all that with our clients. Some clients were not open to, you know, to delving into those type of areas, you know, um, because I not only had a clinical practice, but I also had a neurofeedback practice. And it was, that was, that one was a really interesting, there was one client I had um, that had a traumatic brain injury. He had all these uh, shelves fall on his, uh, on his head and, and uh, he lost consciousness. This was in a work related situation. And, um, you know, he, he wasn't functioning cognitively very well. He was depressed. He couldn't sleep. He had pain. You know, he's going to a neurologist, and the neurologist wasn't helping much at all. Neither was the medication. So, you know, I got the referral thinking like, well, if we can't do it, <laughs> yeah, you can give a try at it. And actually, he did very, very well in neurofeedback. We, we got him to um, uh, uh, start sleeping more. The pain became less. And uh, he was starting to feel more confident. And that was that was just brainwave training to get the slower wave areas of his brain, which had been damaged, to start making a little bit faster, more focused frequencies. So at one point, I, he still wanted to go back and resume his old life, you know. And, you know, it's just you kind of know that's not going to happen. There's been enough damage. You know, I can re help restore you to a certain point. But you know when there's just been too much damage done. And so I decided to do an alpha theta deep state release of trauma work with him. And as I'm sitting there and I'm watching the e the uh, the EEG waves across the screen, and he's he's uh, sitting back in this chair with his eyes closed and following the signs. The sounds lead him to get reward when he's making the more desired frequencies we want him to make. And suddenly. Oh, within five minutes after getting into the session, uh, everything on my EEG screen went wild. I mean, the amplitude was all over the place. I mean, and I, immediately I'm quiet. I'm looking my wires, everything. What's, you know, is there something that got disconnected? What is this? And there was nothing amiss. And I looked over at him and, he, you know, not a, not a twitch. He's not moving. It's not, you know, artifact from movement or anything like that. And... Um, 
And then I was aware that there was a presence in the room because the room felt electrically charged. And I remember thinking to myself, I know you're here. I just can't see you. And, um, and within maybe a few minutes after recognizing that something was in the room with us, uh, my EEG screen just returned to normal. And, and at the end of the session, it was about a 50 minute session, I, you know, I didn't say anything to him about what had happened on my, my screen. And I said, well, what was that like for you? He goes, oh my God. He said, I saw an angel. And he said, and that angel took me back to a time in my life when I was a child and I was sitting up in the treehouse with my friends and we were dangling our feet over the side and we were happy as can be. We didn't have a care in the world. And he goes, I think that angel was trying to show me my life could be that way again if I just let go. And it was like that great aha moment. You do one session and all of a sudden the, the client, you know, gets it. I mean, that's rare. Um, it does happen, but it, you know, it's rare. And from that moment on, he began um, volunteering his work at a docent, as a docent at a marine science museum. And he started getting involved with his grandchildren like he had never been before and gardening. And he was ha as happy as a clam and he didn't start thinking about having to go back to his old job and reclaim his old life. He had a new life now. And he and this life, that new life could be very, very happy. And so, you know, I've had a couple of times where not dark entities, but actually angels or angelic forces have come into my room. Uh, there was one more, and I should tell you this because they're both amazing. They both always awe me. And I had this one client who was um, dissociative identity disorder, which back then when I was practicing was called multiple personality. And she had well over 150 different altars and fragments and so forth like that. And she'd been abused since the age of six months by multiple caretakers and family members in her in uh, in her hometown. And uh, so she was severely, severely soul fractured. And I worked with her for a number of years integrating, trying to integrate some of these, 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 uh, um, alter personalities. And as I was, and then there was one day after a number of years, she, she sat there and sometimes you could tell when she switched personalities, sometimes there'd be just a little infinitesimal blink or a twitch in the face. And you knew something was happening inside the brain. And all of a sudden, this altar came out and started talking in biblical these and thous, <laughs> which I had never seen before. And I'm thinking, oh, God, which one is this? This is a new one. I hope she didn't just create this one. And as I'm thinking that, the she identified, or whoever was using her body at the time, um, identified itself as uh, an entity from outside her internal biological system and identified itself as an angel, and then went on to tell me that I needed to start preparing this client because in six months, I was going to not only leave the practice, I was going to leave the state. And up, and I was, I didn't have any plans up until then. I'm thinking like, oh my God. And then this, this angel proceeded to tell me that three gifts were, were awaiting me. And, um, and sh sure enough, I mean, I won't go into that because that's private, but all of a sudden, when this entity was done, my client slumped forward like a rag doll and didn't have any recollection of what had taken place. And um, as circumstances had it, there was a number of them that I did move from there. In Vir it was Virginia Beach, Virginia. I did move to California. And um, and the first, uh, and I know which which are those gifts that were promised to me. And I had, this is the only client for, I, I can't tell you how many years I took pro bono. I never charged her because she just didn't have money and I couldn't accept her insurance. And um, so, you know, I thought, okay, maybe that's a gift. But it told me that, you know, there's a lot of unusual things out there. Now, those are the good things. Of course, you know, some people have had, you know, uh, experiences with the dark forces as well. Um, and, uh, but while I was practicing, it seemed I had more, uh, I'm retired psychologist now, but when I was practicing, I had a lot of unusual, very positive entities come into the room and check things out and want to help.
And so I was very appreciative of that because sometimes I would just, you know, if I get stuck and I'm thinking, what do I do with this client? And I just go inside and say, what do I do now? And an idea would pop into my head. I'd, I'd go with that idea and it would be very helpful. Uh, go through your near-death experience. Uh, well, my near-death experience happened in 2003. I was, I was, I had a private practice in um, Los Angeles where I was living, and uh, um, my last client of the day was uh, a Buddhist. And she said she was a Buddhist nun, um, and she told me this. Oh, this is uh, she was leaving. Oh, this is the night of a Wesak moon, and I had never heard of what a Wesak moon was. And so I asked her and she said, ah, it's the, it's the, it happens. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's May 8th, usually around May 8th and each year. And she said, it's when the veils between the dimensions get very thin and anything can happen, even magic. And I remember thinking, oh, that's a good story. <laughs> uh, and I just kind of like, oh, that's nice, <laughs> you know? And it was my last client of the day. And as I'm going to my, um, my car in the parking lot, I feel this energy, this whoosh, come right out of my solar plexus area. And with it, I felt like I'd lost all my best friends, like I was done with my work here on Earth as I know it. And it was the strangest feeling. I didn't know what it meant, but, you know, and I thought, am I getting ready to die? Because, you know, it feels like everybody's left. I don't even know who everybody is, but it feels like everybody's left, the, the, the building. And uh, so um, it didn't incapacitate me or anything. So I went home and I was analyzing this as psychologists tend to do, overanalyze things, what did it mean? And uh, as I'm sitting there drinking my tea, um, all of a sudden I felt, saw this swirling vortex in my head. And the next thing I got was sucked through this tunnel, horizontal feet first, traveling at a high rate of speed. And I could see light at the end of this tunnel. And, um, you know, the first thing when you think of when you go through a tunnel that has light is this, is this the tunnel everyone's been talking about? And if so, did I die? And what did I die of? Because I'm certainly ill. But, you know, there's not much you can do. It's, it's interesting to think, see what thoughts go through your head during this process. And, and uh, but I got stopped before I was allowed. To, I was not allowed to go into the light. I was, got stopped right before it, and I just hovered there. I <laughs> tried to will myself to go into the light to see what it was all about, and it wasn't happening. And I I had the the thought that well, this is boring. And with that thought, this is boring. All of this energy poured into me. I mean, it was like an implosion or explosion or whatever you want to call it. And I was spun back around and sent back through the tunnel as fast as could be. And voices in my head were saying, breathe, Kathy, breathe. And I suddenly found myself back in my physical body. And I knew as clear as could be that my heart had stopped and whoever was telling me to breathe and there was nobody around me in the physical world, uh, they were trying to get me to breathe life back into my body. And um, my whole left side was paralyzed. I couldn't move. And I uh, wasn't sure what, what to do about that. I mean, there's always that moment of panic. You know, I'm alone. What can I do? So, and the voices seemed to be very comforting. They seemed to know what was, what was going on. So I didn't, I listened to them, even though voices in your head are not good to hear. <laughs> you know, sometimes that you have to question your mental health. Um, and as they told me to just relax, every part in my body just reconnected. And I could actually hear the clicks in my head as they were reconnecting me. And when I, when feeling returned to the left side, um, all I was left was with a little pressure in my heart chest area. And I do remember thinking I, I better go see a, a cardiologist about this. And they pretty much said, no, you don't need to see a doctor or a cardiologist or anything. You'll be okay. So I figured that was the end of it, but it wasn't. Um, because for every night afterwards, I was being, I was getting up between three and 4 AM with all of these, you know, scientific quantum, uh, cosmos, the universe, whatever thoughts going through my head. And, uh, and I couldn't go back to sleep until I got myself up, went over to my computer and started researching. 
uh, these thoughts. And um, I was really kind of amazed because I was never a, a science geek or anything like that. I was really amazed that that I was understanding what I was reading. And the interesting thing was that these beings, whoever they were, because I didn't really know at that time, or these voices, I should say, were uh, were correcting certain things I was reading on the screen. Uh, you know, basically saying, well, that's true, that's not true, but that's as far as your race's understanding has gotten in the scientific realm. So this was going on night after night, and I go into work the next morning, and I would feel every client's emotional junk, anger, you name it, and it did not feel good at all. I didn't know what to make of it. I'd never had that experience before. So uh, not knowing else to do, I called a good friend of mine um, who I'd worked with um, professionally. Uh, he's a medical intuitive and uh, very credible, incredible at his uh, craft. And he could look at things from a soul perspective, what was going on. And I had worked with clients with him and with the client's permission, just giving their name, no, no history or, you know, on whatever they were going through. He just wanted their name and their permission. He would go in and look at what was happening from a soul perspective. And then with that knowledge, I could then work with these difficult clients knowing what they were navigating. And so I asked him, can you just take a look at what's what's happening with me? And uh, it took him a long time. And and he came back and he goes, well, you almost died. And he said, but uh, the interesting thing is, he said, it looks like it was a soul contract. You came in and you still had you could still say yes or no. And apparently you must have said yes. He said, because you've got all this new guides. All oh, they're all kind of technologically oriented, almost kind of geeky. And uh, that was that whoosh feeling coming out of me. He said, all your old guides left. You got new ones. And I never read anywhere in literature about somebody saying their old guidance <laughs> leaving. <laughs> you know, I was like, so that never even occurred to me. And I, I did say to him, well, what do they want? And he said, well, it looks like from what they're showing me that you came back and you're going to, he says, it looks like you're going to invent some type of medical device. <laughs> and I started laughing, thinking like, oh, wow, he's finally wrong. <laughs> and because his batting average had always been really pretty accurate, you know, and helpful. And he's, and I said, I don't know anything about inventing. I don't know anything about electronics. I don't know anything about any of that stuff. And I didn't see my life as going in that direction anyway. And he said, no, he says, they're showing me that they will direct you to the right people who will be instrumental and that uh, um, to trust the process. So, you know, I kind of put that on the back burner, but life wouldn't allow me to put it on the back burner. No matter how hard I tried, it became, as I call it, my magnificent obsession and I couldn't let go of this feeling that I had to do something. I was entrusted with something that that needed to be done and carried out. And um, so, you know, I thought, OK, well, let's go find some quantum uh, scientists and so forth like that. And maybe maybe you know, information will come to me and we'll work with them. And so, you know, whenever I tried to work with somebody on the outside, you know, there would be so many obstacles and blockages. And and finally, I just threw up my hands and goes, I don't know what you want. What do you want? And they said, no, we don't want them to do it. We want you to do it. You have all this knowledge already. You've done it before in the past. It's just going to, in essence, look a little different. And, um, and it took me a while to say yes, because I didn't really know what I was getting myself into on a conscious level, uh, subconsciously, obviously I did. And on a conscious level, so then, so when I agreed, said, okay, I'll, I'll give it a try, whatever, uh, then all of a sudden information started coming down. And it came down in three ways. Uh, sometimes it would be whole downloads of information, of information I hadn't had access to or knowledge or privy to before in the scientific world. And sometimes it would come down in pictures. And sometimes I would just hear it, a voice in my head saying, okay, this is whatever. And so basically, you know, the concept was that uh, it's going to be different from frequency devices that are out there because they wanted me to find out and understand what's all was already out there. But this would be based on nothing but mathematical coding. And, and they said, everything in the universe has a mathematical signature to it. Your DNA is mathematically coded. You need to speak to the, that, your, 
your DNA and your cellular structure in a language you understand, which is math. And I remember laughing at the time and going, is this a cosmic joke? You know, that math was my worst subject in school. And um, so what began as a process where they were giving me the codes, you know, and I'd sit down and I did this for months on end and, you know, just a, a thousands of different substances, uh, emotions, um, you name it, you know, uh, whether it be vitamin C or anger or anything else that gave me the emotional algorithm for that particular thing so that you could give instruction to the body and help it uh, heal itself quicker because it was giving instructional programming. So that became the whole process of working on what became the Trinfinity 8 software. It took five years to develop. Uh, it was not an easy process. Uh, had I seen the whole thing that they wanted me to do up front, I probably would have run in the other direction. So, uh, but Spirit sometimes gives you as much as you can handle. And, you know, sometimes it's taking it in small steps and that's pretty much what happened until till the day it was ready to be debuted to the world. So, okay. Um, so, so what, how did I debut it to the world? <laughs> no, well, let's, um, did you ever, uh, the guides, did you ever know your guides that left? Um, you know, I never really thought of them, except I remember once um, before my near-death experience, I had uh, spent some time at uh, Bob Monroe's Institute in uh, the uh, Monroe Institute of Science in Virginia, because I lived in Virginia, and uh, he did all out-of-body research, and I forgot this incident, actually, um, because a good friend of mine who I grew up with uh, in high school, uh, her name was Carolyn Miss, and she did uh, Anatomy of Spirit, and she she uh, was psychic. She's been Oprah the whole nine yards over the years, and she wrote many, many, many books. And um, she uh, she's the one that told me that, you know, I should go to the Monroe Institute. And uh, um, so, you know, I did, and I had some very, very, very unusual experiences in remote viewing, which I had never tried before. And uh, and talking with animals, uh, um, mental telepathy with animals, and uh, and I had some experiences, uh, astral out of body experiences while I was there, and and uh, um, you know, and I didn't expect any of this really to happen, it, but it did happen. And uh, uh, Monroe visited me one night in his. Uh, in my chamber and uh, to see if I would remember that in the next day, uh, he, you know, he, he said, how, how did you sleep last night? I said, yeah, I saw you were there. <laughs> he wanted to see if, if, if I recognized. And, you know, so he kind of kept track of me to some respects. And, and, you know, some of my experiences were put into his books as well. Uh, journeys, uh, journeys out of body, uh, not journeys out of body, far journeys was put in. In fact, you know, I, I had a particular experience in that that uh, must have sold a lot of people to go to his thing. And years later, I said to him, you know, I think you owe me money. Because, <laughs> you know, uh, I remember going back and one woman says, oh, I want that astral sex experience that one woman had at the Institute. And I was sitting there going, uh, that was me. <laughs> you know, my name wasn't attached to it. And... And so the others at the table go, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I want, I, you know, that's what, why I came. And then I realized, oh, my gosh, <laughs> you know, it was that experience that anonymously that Bob put in there, my experience, because at the time I, you know, I was, I was starting to practice. I didn't want my clients to know my whole personal life, should they ever pick this book up. So, um, so, yeah, so it, and, and I saw guidance back then, this was before the other one, and and it was funny because when they came, would come through, they would show me roller skating. And used, I used to have roller skate a lot as a kid because my father and my aunt were roller skate rink guards. And growing up, they were teenagers. And, uh, and whenever I was stuck on my path in life, uh, my guides would uh, get me to sit down and take off my roller skates. 
And when I was on the right path, I was roller skating. So uh, those were my old guides, <laughs> you know, and I was aware that they were showing me this. But, you know, did I ever spend time trying to get to learn uh, who they were, where they were from, why they were with me? No, I didn't back then. I just assumed, you know, everybody, maybe it's my guardian angel or something, you know, what people call it. So I didn't give it really much thought but when I got these new guides. I did ask them, you know, I wasn't interested in names and they're not interested in names either. That's kind of like sophomore. They said, they said, basically, they call themselves the founders. They'd been here since the beginning of time and they were from the eighth dimension and some from beyond that. And basically, they said, we've we've worked with you in the past. And um, a good friend of mine who's uh, James von Prague, he's the uh, um, uh, a psychic, well-known psychic. And, you know, once he, he was sitting down with me and he goes, he goes, oh, this is weird. They're showing me you're from the Melchizedek order. And I said, what's the Melchizedek order? He says, I have no idea. You're just going to have to look it up. And I looked it up. Those were the cosmic priests to the priests. And he says, and they're showing me you're not from this world. And he goes, oh, Kathy, I always knew you were alien. <laughs> So um, I, you know, I just felt like I was probably reconnecting with with guides that I would worked with in the past. You know, it's not to say I was an eighth level being. I'm not saying that. But, you know, it's sort of like, um, you know, you get sometimes what you need. You just have to ask for it. I didn't ask for it, but he said it was a soul contract. So well, I guess I did on some level. I just was not consciously aware of it at the time. I was going to ask you what was the most interesting experience you had at the Robin Monroe Institute, but I think you just you went ahead and gave that information. Uh, no, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't give you the details of it. No, but if anybody mean, reads the book the details, Far Journeys but, you know, and comes across a woman who had a pretty incredible sexual astral experience, that was me. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you you mentioned it. You just didn't go through it, and I'm sure you, that's a private thing for you, but... Um, I mean, without me asking, you still mentioned what it was. So, um, so, um, so yeah. When you think about it, you know, it's it's like I have to stop and sit down and go and say, yeah, I, you know, I have had some pretty different experiences in my life. You know, I, I, you know, until you sit down and you start, you know, cataloging them and. And I put a number of them in my book, Fractals of God, A Psychologist's Near-Death Experience and Journeys into the Mystical. And, you know, that kind of covered, uh, there was, you know, a little bit more where I was given guidance or I was asked to s deliver a message to someone, and which I did. And, you know, they called on me again. They figured, okay, well, she completed her mission. She's reliable. Let's let's <laughs> let's call on her. You know, um, most people, you know, when they wanted me, wanted something done, uh, you know, I had this reputation in the past. Oh, let Kathy take it. You know, she's she can run with it. And uh, it's not to say that I necessarily wanted to run with this project because it was so foreign to me, you know, inventing software. But, you know, you sort of realize sometimes the things that you think you can't do you end up being able to do it and you're much more surprising. As I say, we're only limited by our feelings of feeling limited. You know, we're actually very unlimited beings and that's part of the, the lesson in life is to realize that. Your Trinfinite system, uh, how does it work? Well, there's three different components going on. Um, one is uh, the thousands of algorithmic codes that were channeled down to me for all the different things in it. There's like 72 different programs, and each of those programs may have hundreds of different properties, algorithms behind it, you know. And so they were telling me basically, okay, uh, the algorithms need to be streamed to the person, but you're also going to need to use, bring in the whole a fractal field. And I'm like, a fractal field, what's that? And they said, uh, um, they led me to a fractal designer of mo uh, moving images. And they said, fractals are like those Russian Matryoshka dolls, you know, a doll within a doll within a doll to infinity. And that's kind of what the universe is like. It's infinite. And, you know, it's like dimensions are within dimensions and so forth like that. And they said, when you when you play the codes behind these playing fractals, because of the nature of the fractal field, it will amplify the information coming through. And then we want you to add a certain type 
of Salvegio sound music, which opens the cellular structure and allows the the body to take the information, the in, the coded information, the algorithms coming through a lot more easily and sets up a resonance in the body. So you got those three components, and then they and I'm like, okay, well, how do you deliver this to the body? Uh, it's a computerized thing, and and so I was writing my, you know, I was. Uh, I was thinking about this, and they always look for things that you may already have in your memory banks that you can relate to. Um, and so they showed me a picture of um, uh, Superman in the Fortress of Solitude downloading these huge crystals about the history of his race. And I'm thinking, oh, crystals. And then I'm thinking, oh, crystals. How are you gonna attach a crystal to a, uh, you know, a laptop computer? And they said, no, it's not that type of crystal. It is a crystal, but it, it has to be grown crystal in a certain way. So because most crystals, they take energy and it traps that that information into. That's why you see all the, the striations and, and rutilations and so forth like that inside a crystal. These need to be lab grown, meaning you, you grow them um, uh, starting with a, a seed, a liquid seed crystal and in an autoclave and you add silicon dioxide slowly and it takes like a month to grow a crystal and then you obviously have it cut and polished and these crystals look like glass they're crystal clear so that they can take information and immediately release it and release it to the person either holding these rods in their hand now the idea was okay i i got this idea but how do i still attach it to the computer so one day i was riding my bike in santa monica down the ocean front and they kept forcing me to look down at my bicycle handles and you know the rubber tubing and i go oh Oh, I get that. Yes, I can put a crystal in there and and have it hug it and put the right connections inside it and make jacks and have it go into a digital to analog box, you know, uh, because the body is more analog in nature and so are crystals. So it has to go from digital to analog. Most things go from analog to digital. So, you know, it had to be reversed and so that it could stream the algorithms through the crystal into the amplifier box, through the cords and into the crystals, which you could place in your hand or place anywhere on your body, depending if you were working on an injury or something like that. You know, if you had a knee injury, you might want to place it on your knee instead of in your hands, but it really didn't matter. And then they started to show me that um, you could also use this technology remotely. And, um, you know, I was just experimenting and on this and I thought, oh, remotely, that sounds really woo woo, <laughs> you know, out there. You mean it doesn't have to touch the person, you know, people like to have things in their hands or touch it or make it real. And so, you know, one day I was talking to my favorite aunt who still lived in Chicago and I was, I was in LA and she had just had a hernia operation and she, uh, and she, uh, got out of the hospital and, uh, well, within a day or so, she said, uh, I said, how are you doing? She goes, I think it's infected. She said, I called the doctor. I'm going to see him Monday morning. And um, I said, well, would you like me to send you some energy and some good maybe healing energy? And she said, yeah, sure. Uh, I think she thought I was going to pray for her or something. I don't know what she thought, but she just said yes, and that's all I needed was her permission. So I put her on and I thought, oh, it's long distance. Maybe I better make it an hour long, you know, and she here she's 80 years old. And, uh, you know, and I put things like in detox and and tissue repair and immune systems, all these things to kind of help her fight whatever was going on in her body. And uh, so I called her Monday that evening thinking that she'd already been to the doctor and I said okay well what are the doctors and I didn't tell her when I was going to run it by the way I ran it on Sunday and she I said uh, what did the doctor say and she goes oh I canceled the doctor I said why did you do that she says well it was the darnest thing she goes I couldn't even though it wasn't feeling good I still wanted to go to my bingo group <laughs> she, she was a diehard bingo player and she went on Sunday and she said all of a sudden um she said I came back from that I was a little tired and I decided to take a shower. And as I'm in the shower, all of a sudden, all these feelings came over me. And she said, I, you know, it was like, 
she said, I I felt so tired. And she, what she was describing to me was a detox reaction because I had put detox in there. And she says, so I decided to lay down, take a nap, you know, 10 minute nap. That 10 minute nap turned into an all nighter. She didn't wake up till the next morning. And my, my aunt at the time, she's deceased now. She was a night off. She never went to bed, you know, before 11 o'clock, 11 PM. And she said, I woke up the next morning and she said, the redness, the swelling was gone. And cause I'd done decreased inflammation and swelling and the number of things that, you know, would have been good. And, uh, hold on a second. I, I, uh, all of a sudden got a notice here that my mat- battery is not, let me just check. My battery is, is, is running low. Okay. Sorry. I'm back. And, um, she said, uh, she said, so, you know, I canceled the doctor and uh, she said, I had all this energy, so I cleaned my house. And, and then I realized, okay, you send too much energy to her as an 80 year old woman, just because she lives on the other, you know, almost on the other side of, of the, uh, the mainland that, you know, you didn't need to send so much. And, uh, but it did it, what it's, it's trick. And, and from that moment on, we started to realize we could either use a photograph or a piece of the name uh, of the person and, and work it from there. So, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, at that point in time, I had already debuted it at, uh, an energy conference in Denver, Colorado. And, uh, these were all subtle energy workers, professionals, and I just put out a few laptops and I said, here, try it. No charge, you know, nothing like that. I just need feedback. And the feedback I was getting was amazing where I started to have a line at my booth and people were talking and spreading the word and they were telling me what they were seeing going on around the body during certain protocols playing and so forth. And I think the one that really stuck in my mind was there was this one guy, he was an optometrist and, and a psychic, which I didn't know. I didn't know anything about him. He got, and he didn't know anything about me either. And he got on the device and within a short period of time, he was crying. And I thought, oh my God, he's had a bad experience. <laughs> I wonder what happened, what, what did I do? He gets off the device and he said, thank you. He said, I got on the device and my guides knew exactly what this device was for and started sharpening like like a radio signal, my, in, my psychic abilities. He said it was like unbelievable. They became so sharp. He said the next minute I saw all the beings of light behind this device. And he said, and I saw, I saw a man come forward who identified himself as your father. Now he didn't know my father had died shortly after I'd had my near death experience. And he uh, said, uh, uh, he said he was your father and he just wanted you to know it was money well spent. And the money that uh, helped develop the Trinfinity 8 um, came from my parents' death and what they had left me. So I used that thinking like, okay, well, you know, I'm not going to go out there and raise money for it because I don't know what I'm really doing. And let's go see if, if just, you know, I just would say to myself, please, God, do not send me on a fool's mission. And um, so it was a, a whole process in trust. Uh, so what, what did you bring back? Uh, what gifts, if any, did you bring back from your near, near the near death experience beyond aside from the guides that helped you build this amazing technology? Did you have, uh, obviously you mentioned that you were more psychic after you were raped because of that, the way that experience came out. But uh, well, I have to say, not psychic. I was more intuitive. Right. Well, that's yeah. a different not flavor. Quite. The same, <laughs> uh, same ice yeah. cream. I have, I have two different definitions for intuitive versus, you know, psychic. So, you know, psychic, psychic is more profound, and you know, they can they can tell you, you know, what's happening in your future, or or what, you know, where you've been, and what uh, all that, and you know, that wasn't something that I was uh, proficient at. But you know, I would get. I would have strong intuitive hits on things. Well, you um, obviously you had uh, you brought back a proficiency for um, technical things, 
we know that because yeah, you well, went yeah. looking for that. But is there anything you brought back that you haven't mentioned already? Well, yeah, creativity. I mean, big time creativity. You know, I started, um, you know, I've, I've done a number of things before. You know, I got my doctorate in clinical psych. And, and uh, one of the things, you know, was that I started out in the news business in New York City. Started out as a researcher and then, you know, did some associate field producing and so forth like that. And, and you know, then life took me in a different direction. But, you know, what... what uh, what I, I went back to is like writing, uh, writing blogs, writing all about spiritual weird stuff. I mean, you know, if you go on the trinfinity8.com website and, and hit the blog tag, you'll see all the stuff that, that uh, you know, that I wrote about. Uh, I went to Egypt, uh, more information about past lives and what things that I'd done in the past opened up there. You know, I was allowed into places that normally people would never get allowed into and to discover stuff. You know, I've been on alien artifact digs. I've been underneath in the water tunnels of the Great Pyramid. I've been up the ass of the Sphinx, you know. <laughs> so, uh, and I've written about all that. And uh, and then I, I started writing um, sci-fi novels as well. And uh, two are out so far, and I'm working, uh, finishing the third right now in, this, in a trilogy series. We'll talk more about that. I remember you saying on uh, Jeff's sci uh, podcast that you had gone down below the pyramids and you saw the rivers, uh, river and you saw the sarcophagus in the river and you wanted well, to open was, the It was just in the water. It was water tunnels. I, you know, I can't say per se that it was a river. It's certainly not the Nile River. So, but it was water tunnels underneath the ground and there's water tunnels since then after I found out there was, there's water tunnels under most of the major pyramids, at least uh, there might be under all of them for all I know, but there's under uh, Chichen Itza and Cozumel, under Teotihuacan in Mexico, under the Bosnian period, the pyramid in Croatia. Uh, they all have water tunnels underneath their pyramid structures. So uh, it was obviously uh, the whoever built them uh, centuries ago, um, you know, was looking for a source of water, whether it be for a hydroelectric. Uh, there's, you know, lots of different things that the pyramids have been used for over the years. And what we use it for now was nowhere near what, you know, may have been used, you know, during ancient times. So, um, but uh, water is the source of all life. And when I went down into the water tunnels under the, you know, I just me, the head of the Giza Plateau, and my, my Egyptologist, you know, and it was like 150 feet down, three different levels, rickety, you know, iron ladders and water washing up around your feet on the end of the, one of the ladders. And there was a sarcophagus in the water. And there was writing on the sarcophagus, and it was buried under the water. And, and uh, I asked the head of the Giza Plateau, has anyone ever opened this? And he says, no. Uh, he didn't really want to get into that, you know, talking about it. But my guides immediately told me, well, that's because nobody's going to ever open it. It is hermetically sealed. It was intentionally hermetically sealed, ancient, <laughs> hundreds of thousands, well, not quite hundreds of thousands, but many thousands of years ago. And only the pe person with the right DNA will be able to unlock that particular sarcophagus because it sits on a portal. And, um, you know, we don't need people who don't know what they're getting into and understand that to open up portals. There's enough portals that have been opened by, you know, aliens in certainly in uh, Mexico and other places. And we're not necessarily talking about the um, benevolent ones. Um, okay, so you, one of the things you mentioned in, in Jeff's show was you talked a lot about your, um, who you were in the days of the pyramids. You gave the original purpose of the pyramid and then what it, how that was changed because of the fact that, um, what, what's the, what is the uh, the pharaoh's name that was, Akhenaten? Uh, yeah, Akhenaten. So uh, he was into one god, and the rest of the god, rest of the people were into uh, many deities, and so he was not in favored by them. He was considered the heretic king. 
Right. You know, they tried to wash all all traces of him, you know, from the face of their the you know their all their lineage details and so forth like that. They they totally wanted to wipe them off. Now I you know wasn't I wasn't anybody important. I can't claim to be Cleopatra or any of those people. You know, I was uh, a priest during that time, a priestess, and sometimes I was a priest, sometimes I was a priestess. And I tend to seem to go towards the same type of work. And I was a scribe as well. Many of the priests obviously knew how to read and write, as many of the um, uh, the uh, you know people didn't at that time. You had to be more educated. And you were educated in the esoteric arts. You knew about healing on all types of levels. You knew about transmutation and uh, uh, energy and, and taking energy and making it into matter. And so you knew a lot of things that, you know, the general populace did not know about. You knew frequency, you knew all that stuff. You knew that there was many dimensions. You knew that there was there was brotherhoods from other planets and systems. And most of this stuff would have scared the normal people. Maybe it sometimes scares the normal people in this time and day. But um, but that was known to the ancient priesthood, especially the Melchizedek priesthood, which I was told I was a part of. And basically, they were uh, they were centered in uh, the Temple of Abydos, uh, which is uh, um, in Abydos, and it's called it's usually called Seti, the first temple. But you know, there's the Seti, the first uh, actually built the temple that we now see there. But there's an older, much older temple underneath it, and they you know they were able to see a little bit of one of the columns. And so, of course, they're not going to destroy the existing temple to get to the older temple. So most of that, anytime you hear of a place being called a sacred temple in Egypt, it means there's an older temple underneath it, which is what they often did. And in Abydos really had an interesting thing because they believed that, that, that there was a portal there, a portal directly to the afterlife at in Abydos. And um, this, uh, and that the Melchizedek priest could see into the future. And, uh, you know, they didn't talk about time travel, but they, because if you could see into the future and what they didn't know, I mean, they just, there was, is a portal, a major portal. Uh, and it's um, a natural shifting portal at Abydos. And I had uh, learned of this through um, a military person in the aeronautical field who said, uh, who said, you know, there was a number of years ago, we actually were able to bring ET home through the Abydos portal. And I was like, all ears, well, really? Well, where, where's the, you know? And he described to me what this device looked like that opened the portal. And, and he described where it was on the property of the temple, the grounds, and, and so forth like that. And so for years, I, you know, I'd go through looking like, say, where was this place? I, I'm not quite, you know, it's, it's not, I, I'm not getting it. And, but I knew it was there because um, Om Seti, uh, who is very famous, uh, her reincarnation case of Om Seti, uh, she, talked about, she talked about falling through uh, a doorway or, you know, she didn't call it a portal then, but this was you know, many years ago in the early 1900s, talking about, you know, or excuse me, mid 1900s falling through a portal at Abydos. And she knew that temple back and forwards. And she knew the history of it before, you know, during SETI the first time. But to, to, I'm straying a little bit only because this military man said to me, uh, he gave me this description and he was very precise about it, but I could not figure where it was. So I was talking to one of my Egyptologist friends and you know, he's like, ah, and, and, and then a light bulb went off in his head. I could just about see it. And he goes, oh, my God, I think I know where it is. And um, he took me to this hallway that, you know, some people never go down. Or if they do go down this hallway, their their focus is, is on the light at the end of this that goes out to the Azurium. And so they never look at this one particular wall. And there's like something on this wall that's sort of unconsciously telling you, keep going, nothing to see here, nothing to see here. And I actually stopped and I'd been down that corridor many times and I actually had not analyzed and looked at what was on the wall. 
and it was the exact, and it looked almost like that movie, The Time Machine, you know, the Ewok sled with the barrel, you know, and it had certain rungs and so forth. And it was right there in a depiction. And it almost looked like a stairway to heaven type thing. And I, you know, and I asked my Egyptologist, who knows all the temples and all, he says, I've never seen another depiction anywhere like this on any of the temples anywhere throughout all of Egypt. This is the only one. And he says, and I've passed this myself many times without actually really, really looking closely at it. So I got together a number of um, psychic, really good psychic readers, and I just showed them the picture without telling them anything where it was, anything about it. And their impressions were really interesting. You know, one said, stairway to heaven. Another one said, uh, um, uh, uni uh, many universes. They talk, She talked about universes and space and so forth like that. No one actually said a portal, but ever, all their terminology pointing to it was, it was indicative of where that natural portal was. Uh, but it's a shifting portal. And so somehow the military got it to open with their own devices. I mean, obviously, from what I heard, that they do have some of that technology that they can open up wormholes and portals and so forth like that. And so Abydos. And I thought, oh, how interesting. You know, um, Stargate movie focused on Abydos. There's been um, many games out there that focused on Abydos and are called Abydos. And I thought, oh, you know, it's kind of the seed has been planted in the conscious state or subconscious state of man that there's something very unique about the temple at Abydos. So um, you mentioned that the, the original purpose of the pyramid was and then what it actually became. So what, what do you believe was the the original purpose of the pyramids and what did they how did what did that turn into Tell well we, we have to go back to a uh, pre-dynastic history here and um you know most of i say most of our history has been lost hidden or just denied and uh you know we have to before the ancient egyptians was the atlantean civilizations and, uh, you know, we, our science says, you know, the earth has gone through a number of pivotal uh, pivots on its axis. Uh, I forgot how many times, but it was quite an astronomical number. And the third and final upheaval of Atlantis when lands went down and um, tidal waves came and actually lands went down and new lands emerged. Um, some of the ancient uh, uh, Atlanteans who were very advanced and that most of that technological information either disappeared or the ones that survived it were able to take it to ancient Egypt. So the Atlanteans saw the third final upheaval happening, a meteorite hitting the earth and that their land would go down. They were, like I said, many of them were very psychic and started creating outposts around the world. Egypt, India, Antarctica, Antarctica before it became an ice uh, packed uh, uh, landmass, it was very fertile and lush. And in fact, that's what the scientists today, if they go down deep beyond, uh, underneath the core of, of Antarctica, they said, you know, it was this, this was a tropical place at one time. So it says, kind of points to the fact that there's been some shifting of poles throughout hundreds of thousands of years of earth in our history. Man's history goes back you know, hundreds of thousands of years. And uh, so the ancient Egyptians, with the help of the Atlanteans, knew that they would need to be uh, stabilize the earth grid. And um, so Egypt is, lo is looked at as the, not the heart center, but the center of the earth geographically where it's located and don't ask me how they figured that out but it, it was it was located as as a pivotal point on earth that they needed to secure the grid line energies and vortex vortices of that particular thing so, and to tie the pyramids that were now they were now building all over the world mexico india india and all those places like one master um stabilization grid and to 
work together online. And so, you know, they did this to stabilize the earth so that we would not have another tipping of the axis again. And so that was the primary purpose. And then they went in to start using it as uh, interdimensional chamber between this world and the next world dimensional. That's what they call the ascension, ascension devices. And uh, it was especially, especially prominent during Akhenaten's time. Unfortunately, Akhenaten, who was um, very keyed into the one god, Ra, the god of uh, source of all energy, and not the Aten priesthood, who were a very unscrupulous lot. You know, they could be bribed and, and the palms greased, and all they wanted was really kind of money and power. And, and you know, if they didn't want a one god, because they would lose their power unless they had many gods to for the people to give their money to and adore and for them to dole out their 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 um uh kind of tickets to paradise you might say you know so that in the last judgment they could kind of fool the, the scale that was weighing their heart to see if they were of true you know of true integrity and truth so anyway um he he there was many people, and some of those people have all incarnated into this lifetime, and I've met some of them who were involved in the, um, of course, they don't know I know who some of them are, but they were involved in the ascension device in the pyramid to open souls so they could start moving between dimensions and uh, not be stuck in third dimensional <clears throat> earth space. And apparently uh, what they were doing was not working. It got corrupted and it was trapping souls in between dimensions. And um, by the time Akhenaten and some of the priests got wind of what they had actually done, being told that it's working and it wasn't working, you know, it was too late. And uh, now this point is always controversial, but I was told this and, and it rang true with me um, that Akhenaten was, he was an advanced avatar soul uh, and um, he always came during times of critical uh, junctures where man needed to um, shift or an awakening was needed or to get back in torch with su source energy. And because he, he kind of blew it in Akhenaten's time and didn't accomplish that goal, he later reincarnated as the uh, figure Jesus to try to lead man and humanity back to source, to the one God. So, um, and he was Nassim, and Nassim was an ancient uh, uh, Jewish mystical cult. They, they, uh, they were very versed in the mystery schools of Egypt. In fact, you know, the, the uh, being known as Jesus spent a lot of time in Egypt learning the mystery schools, getting back in touch with what he knew in past lives. So it's, uh, it's really interesting. And then, you know, during times, the Ascension device, uh, Akhenaten made sure that the, uh, the capstone was removed from the Great Pyramid so that no one could try and mess this up again. Now, you know, I've I've spent enough time in the Great Pyramid by my, you know, alone time. And every time I walked up the Grand Gallery towards the King's Chamber, I would always look up at the ceiling and it's a corbalted ceiling and it never quite matches. It never has a quite that a juncture a corbalted ceiling should have. It always looked like there's a fake ceiling up there. And I kept saying there's something up there. So one day I just kind of did a little remote viewing and what looked like a small pyramid was up there. And so when they did the scanning the pyramid projects, they found that there was a space above the grand gallery. Uh, and, you know, of course they couldn't open it. The Egyptian government would never allow, you know, anything to of that nature to happen. And But they never said, that, they said there was a space up there. They didn't say whether there was something inside that space. You never, they never went that far. But I think, I truly believe the capstone is actually inside the pyramid, just not to be seen by anyone. And maybe at some point in time, it'll come back in line. But they say it's like a piano untuned at this point. But the king's chamber is like the most incredible sound chamber. And they use sound to um, to heighten states of awareness, uh, to cause uh, resonance and vibrational changes and transmutation and so forth like that. And so it, it developed into um, an initiation chamber. You know, for priests, uh, becoming priests or priestesses down the line, you know, to um, and, you know, now it's just a, a tourist attraction. <laughs> so, like I said, 
it's it's gone through many incarnations. It goes way back more than four thousand years, which the Egyptians claim. They like to keep things four thousand years or less because it kind of interferes with Egypt beliefs about uh, Muslim beliefs about Allah and so forth like that. But um, as Edgar Casey said, that uh, the uh, pyramid goes back um, around uh, ten thousand. 500 or more years ago. So that's quite substantial. And the the Great Sphinx was actually erected before that, way before that. And if you go and um, the geologists look around the uh, and say, there's, there's so much water erosion here. This cannot be from the Nile River, which at one time did come up close to the pyramids. And now it's like five or six miles away because of the Aswan Dam project. And uh, they said this water erosion is profound water erosion. And it could only have come from during the time of the age of Leo, the constellation Leo, when, um, when there was great flooding or it showed that there was some great flood, you know, the biblical flood that, you know, the, the, that is referenced in some of the ancient texts. Well, that actually did happen. Maybe not the way, you know, it's in the Bible, but, but, you know, it did happen. And that's what brought the, the surviving Atlanteans uh, or the ones who knew what was coming down the pike to start uh, making their outposts elsewhere and bringing their knowledge so that it could be saved. Now, people look at the Great Pyramid and the cap, the not only is the capstone off of it, but all the limestone sidings is gone. And if you go back to um, archaeological times, uh, as late as the eighteen early eighteen hundreds, they you know some of the archaeologists you know from Britain and Italy and some of those places were talking about that that there was still the limestone outer exterior on the pyramids, and it had writing all over it. I mean, sort of like the knowledge. And most of that was all taken off and stripped over time and used for building projects. So we lost all of that knowledge that was on the walls of the Great Pyramid as well. So, you know, it's a shame. Like I said, we've lost a lot of our history. It's been hidden or, you know, or, you know, denied or whatnot. And uh, man goes, you know, I say, I've been saying this for years. And if you watch the Netflix series with um, Graham Hancock, you know, he goes to a lot of places where it shows definitely man is a lot older the history than all the uh, the archaeologists and, you know, geologists and whatnot are claiming, you know. And, uh, you know, of course, they poo-pooed him. And but, you know, the truth eventually does come out. Um, recently, I saw a, a very short video uh, that Billy Carson did. It's probably a a um, very small segment of a very long, a much longer video that he probably did for Gaia, uh, which is you know it's pay a pay you know you pay to get access to Gaia. Anyway, in the in the um, video, he starts off talking about the the water below the pyramid and. He's, he he doesn't really explain it um, technically, but you know because it's a very uh, condensed piece of information. But he he just says, well, the water below the pyramid um, somehow became electrical, like with lightning, and then it went up through the pyramid, and then um, and the pyramid was used. To do something with that lightning. And well, you know, he's 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 probably correct in that respect because that portal was open at one time. And when I was down in the very deepest water level tunnels, uh, there was an electrical charge in the air, air in the air. And I I brought out my magnometer and it was not reading what I would consider normal levels. So there is something down there that is uh, definitely electrical. And I think that that's the residual of, you know, the Egyptians used it as then, you know, before they did it to stabilize Earth, then they used it to, I believe, generate electricity. You know, it's, uh, I think that they had lighting and they had a lot of stuff back there that we thought, oh, no, 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 it couldn't be. That wasn't invented until, you know, whatever, late 1800s or whatnot. It's, it's just like the, everybody believes the ancient Rome, Romans uh, um, uh, invented, uh, you know, 
concrete and, you know, and so forth like that. And I saw as clear as could be, no, it went way back beyond that. What they would do is they'd go to like places like the Aswan quarries and the red granite and they'd pulverize it. And they'd bring bags of this stuff to on site and they made forms and they, they, they had some type of agent where they could actually either slow down or speed up the drawing process. If they wanted to slow it down, then they could actually carve things into it. And I saw it as clear as could be that, that, you know, even down below, when I said that there was three levels to below the Great Pyramid, one of the levels before you get to the water tunnels is a, pair, a place that has seven niches in it, big ones, and uh, that uh, would have fit sarcophaguses and two sarcophaguses, big ones, like they look like basalts ones, uh, dark, you know, blackish gray ones uh, are still down there and uh, their, their covers are ajar so you can look inside and see that there's nothing in there. And, but yet you can see that they're all so uniform. Uh, stone cutters don't cut uniform uniformity like that. These were form based. They'd take it down there, do it in place because there's no way they could have gotten it down those shafts. No way. They they built it in place. They slip formed it, released it. In fact, I was wa I was looking closely at the seams on on the two remaining ones, and I saw what looked like just some old resin or something, you know, as if they slip casting it. And I'm thinking, yeah, you know, it's uh, the, it, and some of the stones from the Great Pyramid itself on the outside, um, I believe, were were um, put in place, made in place as well. Because sometimes they find in the stone human hair, fingernails, you know, and uh, that's not what you find in natural stone. That's what you find in like something that's akin to concrete and made in place. So, uh, but it looks like the real thing. And the Egyptians were masters at that. And the Romans took all the, uh, the, uh, the kudos for it. But no, it was all that stuff came beforehand, just like so much of our stuff, you know. It's it's almost like a re-remembering. I think people get inspired because, you know, maybe in the past life they were responsible for creating some of that technology in pre, pre, pre-dynastic or Atlantean times. And it's sort of like sort of like someone said to me once they, they got on the Trinfinity 8 and he got off and he goes, well, I didn't think I'd see this technology again in this lifetime. He said, I remember it from Atlantean times. He said, it looks much different. It's packaged different in a modern package. He said, but it did the same thing. So um, I think that's all we are is re-remembering, you know, what, uh, and if it's not from maybe past life memories, maybe we're just bringing it down from the um, uh, consciousness source, you know, uh, great mind source, you know, it's in there, all that information. Some people, uh, I've heard, rumors and you, you never know uh how much truth there is in, in any given rumor but i've heard rumors that um that people flying over the pyramids could feel like strong subtle energy coming straight off the the uh peak of the pyramid straight up and um and then you know you talk then billy gets the a stronger electricity um, coming from the water, and you know I'm just curious as to whether um, that somebody could have you know could have been using it not the pyramids not necessarily for conventional electrical uh, purposes, but for something more grandiose like shooting uh, you know electricity or some type of either subtle or a regular electrical uh, or combination thereof. Well, it was, a, it was a power source. Yeah. I mean, if you looked at it like our power generator, you know, uh, um, towers and things like that, you know, I mean, Tesla built one based on sort of like that pyramid bringing energy from the earth. You know, we all heard about free energy and so forth like that. And so, no, I'm not a bit surprised. They've done heat resonating images of the Great Pyramid and still shows uh, hot spots in it of energy. So um, you have to remember that inside the pyramid is a lot of quartz and mica. 
and mica retains memory. It's a conductor of electrical, piezoelectric charge, just like crystals are. And the other thing is that uh, someone once told me this, which was interesting. He said, do you ever realize why those all those old stone houses in places like Pennsylvania and Ohio, and you see ghosts, the same ghost image running back and forth, they never do the same. And he said, it's because those stone walls contain mica and mica is able to capture an image or an emotion in it and we can replay it when it, it can be triggered and replayed it over and over again. And, you know, it's sort of like inside the pyramid, quartz and mica, conductors of, of electrical energy. Well, uh, this earlier today, I was watching uh, a particular lady's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm follow, I'll follow a particular person, uh, their understanding and watch as many videos as I can stomach of, each of them, uh, just to get a uh, an idea of their, you know, whether they're true, you know, saying something that's true, or if they have some other, you know, nuggets of wisdom. Anyway, uh, one of the things she mentioned was that she lives next to a mountain of quartz and on a bed of quartz. And then when she said that, the the she was a guest so the host said well you know and then he starts going into the fact that quartz um that spirits uh interact with quartz just like they interact with water uh they have a unique you know the ley lines the water um you know the subtle energy that comes off the the divining rods that goes down through your body, down the uh, out through the divining rods, and then down into the earth to find the water. So there's a connection with subtle energy, humans, and water. And then, then spirits, uh, you know, they like ley lines. Uh, you know, there's something about uh, all the the sacred or many of the sacred uh, temples around the earth are built on straight ley lines. So there's there's that notion that spirits travel um, on those lines uh, more than other places because they're you know that's a free it's like it's like um, the way le normal electrical signals work through electronics is you have the the electricity flows through the area of least resistance so the ley lines are probably or possibly um, paths of least resistance for spirits to flow and so going back to the pyramids you uh with that electricity coming up off of the river below it which is flowing it's going to flow uh, electrical current because it's if it's moving water uh just like any electrical current going through a, 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 um, a wire would flow and then you got a magnetic field around that but anyway uh, the, the thing about the, the water under the pyramids, it wasn't moving. It wasn't, wasn't quite stagnant, but it wasn't moving either. So I believe at some part in the tunnels, it must be kind of plugged up. And I do believe that it probably links to Hawara Pyramid, and uh, which is about 75 miles away. And I do believe what I saw in my mind was they conducted uh, ceremonies of the transition on the the um, afterlife boat or solar boat or so, um, and sort of symbolic ceremonies. They probably started the pharaoh or whoever in Hawara, and when he went through a boat in the tunnels underneath it until he got to the portal shaft. And um, what they did from there, I'm not sure, but, um, you know, maybe the portal was oh, still open at that time. I don't know. Um, but it definitely, I have a feeling it uh, might have been th that Akhenaten might have sealed that portal as well. Well, okay, so the, uh, and then the, the pilots or somebody saying that there was energy coming straight off the top of the, of the peak of the pyramids, uh, you know, shooting up way up into the sky is what they're saying. The 
In fact, I think I heard this from a fellow who um, takes pyramids and builds them and and checks out the energy coming off of man-made pyramids and things like that. Anyway, um, I bring this up because uh, some people like uh, the man you mentioned earlier, uh, people like him tend to, or a number of them believe that that uh, there are two shafts, one pointing at um, Orion and one. And the other one that's Sirius. Sirius, right? And mm -hmm. so um, if the Egyptian, um, okay, so I interviewed a lady who. By the way, they're not totally lined up anymore. You know, the earth has well, shifted. Well, yeah, but I mean, when they were built, they were lined up. Yeah. Right. So I, I interviewed a lady who had uh, an incarnation in, in Lemuria and in Atlantis and and she was saying that they came from all over the place. They came from uh, Sirius. They came from, um, you know, different different star systems. Uh, the ETs, or not ETs, they were not ETs. They were uh, beings of light or higher level beings that came to Lemuria before the Earth was physically formed as much as it is now. And so if the if the Atlanteans and or Lemurians, uh, when the Lemuria and or Atlantis was destroyed, when those two were destroyed, warring at each other, though, if those people came from the stars, just like she mentioned, and they were trying to get back to those places they came from, and then you have pyramids built by the uh, descendants of those places, they would know we need to get back to those places we came from. And if they align the shafts to those places where they came from, then the theory that a number of men have come up with is that they're, you know, the the um, the knowledgeable pharaohs or whoever who had it been descended from the, the Atlantean Lemurian times, uh, you know, they want to get back. They think that that's where, you know, if you go to, you know, this is r just rumor, it, they were, you know, the, the Egyptians have the Ka and the Ba, and, and one is the body, one is the spirit, and they're trying to reunite the two in the afterlife, right? And they think that the rumor is that if they get back to those places where they where we where they uh, came from uh, in Sirius and in Orion, uh, that in those parts of the heavens they will be able to reunite reunite and get you know to the higher realms or whatever it is they're trying to reach when they get there. So that I guess that's uh, one of those theories that you know. Well, you know, all up. through all through ancient Egypt. Um, you know, the Egyptians don't like to talk about this, but, um, you know, there's, uh, yes, they they were in touch with the Great White Brotherhood or perhaps other, you know, star systems and so forth, Sirius, Orion, um, and many others. And, uh, you know, there's places, uh, Abu Sir and um, um, Saqqara, where they were known to have come, these beings from other places. And it uh, wasn't too, too long, maybe in the last 20, 25 years or so, um, they unearthed uh, a pharaoh's tomb, and uh, buried next to him was this other little creature that definitely, I saw pictures of it, looked alien. And uh, it was marked... Um, uh, the being's name was Aseret, and it said uh, loving counselor to the pharaoh. So um, during ancient times, yeah, I, I'm sure that there was a lot more visitations. And this is, this is we're talking about more pre-dynastic Egyptian, ancient Egyptian times, um, where we don't have as much history from as we do from like, you know, early Middle Kingdom and late and so forth like that. And, uh, but yeah, there was, you know, it's sort of like, I like to say this because, you know, during the Arab Spring uprising in um, 
was it February 2011 uh, when Cairo was, uh, you know, in chaos and they shut the country down. And um, many of the young Egyptologists formed a human chain link around the uh, Museum of Cairo and to wait until the military came to uh, to secure it because, you know, there was some incidences of starting to loot. And so they formed their human chain. And um, one of the guys said to me, he said, it was interesting. The only place they went to is the fourth floor, which is only kind of like half a floor. You can't get to it. It's behind another door on the third floor. And most people don't even know exists. You have to look from a certain area of the Cairo Museum to even know that there's a little tiny fourth floor there. And he said, that's where they keep all the unmarked, really strange stuff. And he said, that's where they kept the particular Aseret, the, uh, the mummy of the alien body that they found. And of course, you know, somebody was able to sneak a picture of it out of there. And uh, um, he said, uh, he said, I've heard rumors that they, they've even found some spaceships. Now, when I'm at Luxor Temple, I swear there, you get into the hippostyle main area there, and if you hit a certain particular area of that, that kind of like a huge courtroom with, and there's columns all around and you hit a certain part and your head starts to spin in a counterclockwise manner which tells me there's electromagnetic energy somewhere and so i called in all of my energy people and i said let's uh, can you can you feel anything here and they go oh wow and they said the same way counterclockwise spin and so we kind of mapped out the area to see how far the parameters were you know how many feet by how many feet and so forth and um then we called a few Egyptologists who were more in the know, and and they said, oh, he said, yeah, he says, I think I know where you're talking about. He said a couple number of years ago, they dug underneath the Luxor Temple, and they found all these huge stake, snake statues, because there were snake cults, you know, just like there's there's demonic cults now there was snake cults and other things back then and he said uh, um he said one of those statues is now in the luxor museum and i knew exactly which one he was talking about and he said and they found some really strange stuff under there so the re residual energy is still there just like the residual energy is still coming out of the great pyramid now the capstone wasn't there so you can imagine if the capstone was on which was gold and crystal and a number of things you know uh that was a conductor a capacitor conductor and if that was still there you can imagine the energy so what you're feeling is still just residual energy from what once was there but you know that place had to be pretty powerful and that's why akhenaten said no we we, we can't allow this to be continue to be corrupted and a man to use this in a way it was not intended to be and for the safety of all involved this capstone needs to be taken off and from that moment on it became a piano out of tune and uh, and will it ever be put back on? Uh, that remains to be seen. I don't know. Maybe maybe when man becomes more evolved, um, we're not at that stage yet, obviously. Well, the lady uh, I interviewed who had the lives in Lemuria and Atlantis, she said that the um, there were beings of um, she called them dark robed beings, and they were. Um, archontic type uh, aliens that were, um, you know, very corrupted. And they, she, she went into a lot of different things about them, but she said they were the ones that infiltrated Atlantis and caused its destruction. And, uh, but, um, oh, for some reason I brought that up. I can't think of what it, well, you know, we don't like to point fingers at different alien species or so forth, but definitely there, there's still um, Temple of Hathor and Dendara. There's one area that every year I go into and it's like I need to get out of there fast because my head is like in a vice. It's it's like somebody the pressure is so deep and so the there's so many dark spirits in there, even though it's supposed to be a temple of love and light, there's still, you know, influences that come in and latch onto it. So this last time I was there in December, I brought some heavy duty people with me uh, who can see all this to help start to clear it. 
And although I couldn't see what they were doing, I was standing back. And as they were working on it, one was working up from above, the other was working from below, and they both could see what each other was doing. It was just like amazing that all of a sudden I, I, the, the energy in my head just, just got lighter and lighter. And that, you know, that like somebody's, your head's in a vice just kind of disappeared. And I knew, and then afterwards they said, oh my God, there was like about 53 entities in there. And one, there was one big one that was trying to hold all the others back from leaving. And, you know, they, they went into great detail. And, and so, you know, I know that stuff is still there, you know, wherever there's light, there's going to be darkness trying to come in and do their thing as well. There's always going to be the battle. And, you know, even in the most, you know, ancient sacred temples, you're going to see this stuff. And uh, some of it is, you know, hundreds, thousands, whatever years old, it's been there for a long time. Well, the in, in any um, positive area, the darkness is going to gravitate to there to try, to try to corrupt it. And so in order to corrupt it, it's going to, um, do things like human sacrifice, you know, like with the Mayans. Uh, somehow it's the, anything that's uh, very destructive to the psyche of any creature that causes pain is going to distort the field around it in that area. And, uh, and if your uh, associates were able to clear stuff, that's the that uh, speaks volumes about their talent. So yeah, uh, I, mean, I mean, I'm sure other people have. And then, you know, sometimes what they need to do, and I don't know if anyone suggested this to, you know, the Department of Antiquities in Egypt, is they need people proficient in this ability to come in and regularly clear those temples. Because, you know, dark people who are in human form right now come in and you know, use their their kind of spells and other stuff to latch on to some of that energy. And so they they need full time uh, energy clears in most of these places. And, uh, um, you know, I don't think anybody's ever, <laughs> you know, suggested that. But I think it'd be worth the wild and people would really have even greater experiences in these temples because of it. Yeah. Well, you consider yourself an explorer of Egypt because probably primarily because you remember being there and so it it um, it fascinates you because you've spent a lot of time there previously in previous incarnations and so that those lifetimes draw you back to uh, familiar ground and you want you're obviously a very curious person and you want to fill in the pieces about the things that you don't, we don't have the answers to, obviously. The, well, you, you know, it. I wasn't thinking along those lines. It was my guides that said, you know, now that you're, you've completed this device, you need to get in touch with your roots and you need to go to Egypt. And of course, I booked the first time to go to Egypt, uh, you know, a month before the Arab Spring uprising, <laughs> you know, and so I couldn't go. And I had to wait until it was opened and safe to go again. But they knew that it would start to open all those memory banks and get me in touch with what I had done, you know, uh, with many others in the sound healing world, you know, in um, in the energetic medicine world, in all those very esoteric healing arts so that I would remember, and uh, and I did. And, you know, oftentimes I would go to places and someone would say, well, this is where they did this and this is where they did that. And, and that was kind of the official narrative. And I, and I would kind of take my people up to the side and go, that's not true. This is what this, this is what they were really using it for right now. And, and then sometimes later I would find they would dig up something that would actually verify, oh, because, you know, at Saqqara, I would say, this is not an, this was not an open temple, a, you know, playground to run chariots or whatever around like you seem to think or, or horses. This was once the opening to the temple sacrifice leading to the temple beautiful. Those were all temples that were used in Egypt times, temple sacrifice, temple beautiful. And um, sure enough, a number of years later, they found the entryways into it. So they kind of revised their thinking. But, you know, it's sort of like, 
you know, uh, when I first saw it, did I remember that immediately? You know, it's sort of like, you know, it's like, no, this is, I remember this differently. And over here, there was a lake. There's no lake now. There was a lake then. And uh, this is where, you know, all the, the students, you know, they they stayed and they used this one for for uh, this particular sound resonance. And, you know, the 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 whole non-existing wall that what used to be a full wall all around it and had special markings like a Saqqara that you can't find anywhere else in any of the temples. In fact, they kind of look like the motif design, motif design that Frank Lloyd Wright used in a lot of his glass windows. And I'm sure he must have gone there and been inspired because it is the Saqqara motif. And, you know, they use that as a frequency fence. They would get in the niches of it, uh, you know, slotted and uh, raise their frequency. And, you know, it's like people who didn't have the right frequency did not feel comfortable coming into that temple. And that's how they, they kept, you know, some people out so that they can continue to do some of their what would be considered magic or miracles or kind of in today's day and age there without, you know, without the... Uh, the um the local folk freaking out <laughs> so besides um your guides that they're from the eighth dimension and they call themselves the founders is there any other information you can give us about your guides um your current guides well, you know, it's kind of interesting because even though they're still there right now, they stepped back just a little bit because um, uh, to write these new books that I'm writing, which kind of leads us into that next segment there, um, and the sci-fi world. And, I, you know, we all have access to many muses. I mean, I still have access to them when I need it. You know, somebody asked me recently for the Trinfinity 8, can you give us an adverse event protocol to use for injuries? And I asked my guides immediately, you know, what was the best thing to use? And, you know, I put it out there. In fact, um, I, I should be careful because if you put this on YouTube, they'll probably, so I don't want to say any more. Um, you know, and I got, I got news today from, uh, um, and this is just recent, from someone in Japan using it. And they said, wow, this was really given us uh, and people hope, and it makes them feel really good of what they're dealing with. So, you know, um, so they, you know, when needed, they still come forward. And, uh, but I think the brunt of their work is done. And now, now it's channeling through all these sci-fi books in which the interesting thing was, you know, is, is they gave me a dream about the whole plot. And I woke up in the middle of the night and I saw it as clear as could be. And, you know, I started writing it down and basically, you know, it's about this library employee in the library of Congress who, uh, discovers, accidentally discovers an interdimensional portal into a library of truth and where he discovers everything on everyone. Everyone's got a really kind of like the Akashic records. And, uh, you know, it's uh, so this, it, the darker he, and he tries to release some of this information without being um, identified or caught and, you know, cultivates a deep throat uh, journalist. And, you know, he's trying to, you um, trying to expose the corruption in the world that's been going on forever and that's been and that certain elements have been using this this library within this library called the library of truth uh, to manipulate man so this book led into the first book stacks library of truth then led it to stacks awakening truth the second book and right now i'm i'm doing the third and final book in the trilogy which is stacks truth shall set you free and you know as i'm writing it they're channeling it through i mean there's parts in the book where i didn't know where they were going with it and all of a sudden i was like oh you know and i it's been the books have just kind of flown out of me they it's a story that really wanted to be told and um I'm, you know, and it's got a little bit of everything, you know, sci-fi, crime, thriller, romance, mystery. And, uh, you know, I like to tell people, which is my intuition again. Well, my guides actually told me they said uh, this was in um, this was in January of 2020. And just as COVID was kind of hitting and uh, they said, Make sure you get yourself to the Library of Congress to do your research no later than the first week in March. 
And, you know, I had a group to lead to Egypt in February. I'm thinking, well, what's the rush? But I made, I made, you know, my plane and reservations and everything. And I get there and uh, spent a whole week with the librarians going behind the scenes, getting everything accurate, you know, because they were really excited. Somebody was really going to write a book that totally took place in the Library of Congress. And a week later, the whole country shut down for COVID. And so did the Library of Congress. And so had my guides not told me to get, <laughs> get myself there, no later than the first week of March, I would never have had that great opportunity because I wanted to make sure everything was accurate and right in these the Stacks Truth series. And, um, you know, so that any employee, whoever worked there who read it goes, you know, wouldn't say, well, she doesn't know how things run here, <laughs> you know. Instead, you know, they would say, oh, she really did her research and, you know. Shades of my old days when I was uh, started off as a researcher at uh, CBS News in New York, you know, get your facts straight. You know, a lot of the journalists of today don't get any of their facts straight, unfortunately. You know, it's all opinion. It's not both sided, even sided. You know, they just don't do their digging. They're unfortunately lazy. <laughs> so. So I worked in the Library of Congress. You did? Where? Yeah. Which department? Uh, well, I was just a consultant. Um, I, I was just brought in to analyze some uh, technology they had um, in their system. But uh, anyway, the only reason I brought it up was because uh, um, when you went to the Library of Congress, did you... Do you remember the statues that are in front of the Congress, in front of the building? Oh, yeah, yeah. There's the fountain with, uh, you know, Neptune and the dolphins. And, uh, you know, they, uh, um, some people have said they've seen something like that in other dimensions as well. And, of course, inside there's all the Masonic, you know, symboli symbolization, symbol symbols, ex symbols, excuse me, and Minerva statues. And I kept thinking, what's what's this deal with Minerva? You know, so my bad guys became Minerva, you know, the organization. And, you know, so I just, uh, they, they took me into the closed stacks, uh, the head of the main reading room, and which is, you know, that octagonal shape, wonderful place, you know, and, and I wrote my actually part of the first chapter in, in that very, in that very room. And, uh, you know, I remember so, doing that. And who comes by me, you know, passes right by me. But, uh, um, uh, oh, gosh, <laughs> his name just escapes me. It was a big country western singer. Um, and and goes, hi, how you doing? <laughs> and, and you know, I, I remember looking up at the wall clock and going, it's a fabulous wall clock with father time and gold and very ornate. But it wasn't keeping the right time. And I asked one of the librarians, well, what's the story in that clock? How come nobody's either wound it or what's this, you know, and she goes, oh, that thing has never worked right. So I wove it into the story and I wove a lot of my own experiences, some mystical experiences into, into the series, two series as well. And uh, so people who know me, you know, they can recognize which ones are mine right away. And others will say, where did that come from? How did you know that? You know, I says, oh, I remote viewed that. And that's where I found that one and so forth like that. <laughs> so when you talk about the reading room, are you talking about the room where the uh, the congressman can go in and get a book? And, you know, and it, the whole library is just a reference library. You can't check anything out. That's correct. Right, uh, there's so. there's different rooms. There's the congressional room, which is a private, like a little, looks like a men's law, men's, you know, area. You know, it's, uh, uh, I actually got to sneak in that because usually there's a keypad and you, you can't go into that. And there's got, there's a little balcony, you know, up to the side and I wove that in as well. But it's, it's like a lounge and with television and uh, you can just chill out and read stuff, you know, uh, but I'm talking about the main reading room, which is big, very big. And like I said, it's octagonal shaped and all on the perimeters of that octagonal shaped room is, is the closed stacks, which no one's allowed back in. And my character works in the closed stacks. So it was really, really important. I see that, get it right. And, you know, they have, they have card files back there 
that go back to, you know, early 1800s when Thomas Jefferson started the library. It wasn't right there at the time. It was a different one, and then it, it got bigger. But he gave the first, you know, collection of books of his own to the library. And some of those card files um, are, are written, handwritten in ink. And, uh, you know, it's like a, a, a blast out of the past. And uh, it is cold back there, too, you know, to preserve the books. But... You know, it's like it, it's uh, every, the people in the main reading room, you know, go to the uh, circulation reference desk, put in the request, and it's sent back to find the materials. And they have materials from everything, congressional records, you know, state uh, telephone books, y you name it. Every Everything is back there. And so it's, it's a fascinating place. I wouldn't mind working there myself. <laughs> well, um, so... When I worked there, I did. I've never actually been in the Library of Congress. That's the <laughs> that's the you know the 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 interesting part. I mean, I have and I haven't. You have to look at it from um, from different angles. Okay, so the the main building, the one with the naked uh, people in front, the naked naked statues, which are uh, what do you oh, call uh, what do you call uh, Mermaids, mermaids, and mermaids. Yeah, some people call it Poseidon, some call it Neptune, and it's got some dolphins and uh, some other little things in it. Yes, but it's 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 the main fountain in front of the right. main entrance. So, that's the main building. Now, there are multiple buildings to the Library of Congress. The primary building is the one that everybody Thomas, knows. So. Thomas Jefferson Building is the main one, and and right. then there's. You know, the Adams Building and the Madison, you know, these are all where the administrative offices are and so forth like that. Uh, and, you know, maybe extra collections that, you know, didn't fit because you've got you've got thousands of books coming in every day to that library and it's gotten bigger and bigger. And then there's all these tunnels under the Library of Congress that lead to other buildings on Capitol Hill, you know, lead to cafeterias or cafes. I mean, it's like an no, interesting little city underneath there. Uh, so, cause if you're, you know, in front of the Library of Congress, there's not a lot of traffic, but you know, but there's this hubbub underneath that uh, that people use all the time, rain or shine? Well, the building I worked in was, um, you, if you walk in front of the uh, the Library of Congress where the, and look to your left where the statues are, and you, you, you know, you're on the sidewalk and you're standing facing the building, to your right is a, it's a corner. The, bu the building is on a corner. And so if you keep going down the street, you're, you're on that's in front of the Library of Congress, it T-bones into another street and you go across that street and that's where the other building, the building that I worked in was that building. And that building is, there's actually not much special about it. It's just a, I mean, I'm not saying it's not special. I'm just saying that it's nothing compared to the main, the main library. So anyway, the only reason I brought it up is you mentioned uh, reading room, and I've only since I didn't get to work in the action, the main building, I didn't get to see all the stuff you saw. And the so, the architecture in that building just blows you away. It's right. beautiful. So, so, one day I, I got a, a tour of the library itself, but not, not the part that you got to see, the part that the public is allowed to see. So, you go under the, like you mentioned, the tunnels underneath. And you can go into the library from underneath, from the tunnels. So you go up in the one area that's, it's not in the, the building itself. It's like it's, it's sort of like it's next to the building on the outside, on that one inner side where the building is butted up against the next building. And so uh, you're, you're allowed to see in one room, and it's a reading room. But you're looking through glass that's like six, it's like six inches thick. You know, you could fire, you could set off a mini nuke in there. It wouldn't go through it. It's like, it's made so that uh, the congressman can sit there and read and there's nobody going to ever attack them because it's like bullet, super bulletproof. Well, but, I don't, in, in the congressional reading room, uh, most of those windows face 
out onto the street and they wouldn't be seen well, from others. So they could very well, what you saw was there are many small reading rooms in the Library of Congress. The only major big one is the main reading room. Like I said, that's huge. And not every, you, you've you got to go through a metal detector. Yeah, kids are not allowed in that under a certain age. You have to have a reader's card to get in. And which means you have to sit and apply for it. You have to get your picture taken and not the general public just can't stroll in. They can go up to the mezzanine and look down into it from a, a glass partition and see what's going on down there. But, you know, they want to keep the public, general public out of there because the researchers are in there. And um, and the same thing is that had I not uh, they didn't want to take me into the congressional private meeting room. But, you know, I followed my instincts and I kind of always was walking the corridors. And one day somebody must have left and the, the door was just slightly ajar. So I just walked right in and started taking pictures <laughs> so that I'd have a reference point for my characters. If they came back into the room, what was in the room, what it looked like. And I didn't get caught. And I must have been in there for 10 minutes or so before, you know, I decided, okay, this is getting a little bit long and uh, I need to probably make an exit before somebody finds me in here. But, you know, divine guidance said, go for it, Kathy. You know, it's like, what what could they say? I would just, you know, would have said, oh, well, I thought this was another room. I just stumbled in. But the, the keypad is that every Congress, Congress person, whether it be a senator or a congressman, has their own code key. So they know who goes in there. And so, you know, you, uh, so if anything's missing, they know who's been in there, you know, and so forth like that. And, uh, but, uh, and uh, you don't hear too many about women. It, it feels more like an old boys club. Well, the, um, the, the only room I got to see in the actual library itself ever was a small reading room. And it was, uh, you know, obviously it's made for the congressman because it's the Library of Congress, but the way it was laid out, first of all, as I mentioned, it was surrounded by glass, uh, bulletproof glass, but the actual room itself was not, it's not terribly small, but it's not big either. But it, what it may, I'm going to describe it, so maybe you've actually been in this room. So what it does is it had uh, a circle of, podiums in a full circle and um and there was no chairs it was just podiums and the pod and the lighting in the room was fairly dim not not bright enough to read by but the podiums themselves have lighting built into them which is very bright so you can stick a, a reference book onto the podium and stand there and read it and you have plenty of light coming from the podium but the room itself is fairly dim and well, the main reading room sometimes is a little dimmer and there's concentric circles around a major hub, the main reference desk. And these concentric circles all have like little little areas, you know, uh, desks and uh, lamps and so forth. And, you know, at times, yeah, it does see and there's a big rotunda overneath. There is no other room that, you know, that that would explain that. And my guess is that they probably showed you it from the mezzanine because that has the glass that you can see the whole thing through. But otherwise, you, that's the only view you'll get of it unless you have uh, a reader's card. Right. Well, the, like I said, the, uh, the which I do, <laughs> the walls that uh, surrounded that room um you know you get into it from from the from the tunnels underneath the building and um it was definitely on the side that was not the side with the facing the the corner uh where the street was this is definitely on the other side but it was just a really you know, it could have been the tunnels lead into circulation management underneath the main reading room. So that's not the stacks. The, the stacks is on the level of the main reading room. So you're talking about circulation management, which sometimes have the conveyors that go up to the reference desks and so forth like that and deliver certain materials that may be not in the stacks, but may have circulated through uh, the rest of the departments. I mean, that place is 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 pretty detailed and and. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's sort of like we, we can go round and round and tell you where it is, but, you know, there's a lot of different things it could have been. But, you know, there's nothing like the main reading room. You know, if you've, if you've seen it in pictures, uh, that's why it said, you know, just Google it. And if that looks like what you've seen, then then you probably were seeing it from the mezzanine. In, well, were, yeah, were, I just remember there was podiums in a circle and no chairs in the room. Not a single chair was in this room anywhere. And it was podiums in a circle. That's the only only thing I know. And, okay, well, uh, the, they all the have room, chairs in the main reading room, so I don't know where you were. <laughs> the room was not much bigger than you know the po the circle of podiums. You may you may have uh, twenty foot, thir twenty or more foot going from a podium to the wall around that room. So it wasn't huge a huge room. It was just you know ten people could be reading. In that room, and that's about all it would take. You know, there's like ten podiums. In okay, it. you were you were probably in an offshoot reference reading room because that wasn't, you know. Right. right. You, yeah, that's that's not the main reading room. The main reading room is huge, right. so uh, there's no mistaking that. You know, you're and the architecture in there is 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 quite as stunning as the uh, the grand hall and um, and so forth like that. But uh, but yeah. So anyway, wherever. <laughs> Anyway, so go look, go look it up on Google and you'll 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 see pictures of it. I think they actually have a virtual tour that you can uh, go through the Library of Congress online and uh, get a get a good view of that. So, um, you know, I'm talking to them now. Hopefully we'll get my books in in the uh, in the bookstore. Uh, they usually do, you know, art and history and and science books and so forth like that. So this might be one of the first that is actually a novel that takes place in there. So. Working at it. So, is there any um, any other interesting occurrences that happened in your life that you would like to reveal this time? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we could go for hours, but who's got? Could hours? we? <laughs> uh, you know, no, I mean, there's a lot of them, and they can get the book Fractals of God. You know, uh, just look up Kathy Forty on Amazon. Uh, both those books, Amazon and my first book in the Truth series, uh, they're all, I mean, they're all in uh, print and Kindle version. And uh, the first, uh, and Fractals of God um, about my technology is also in Audible, and so is the first book for the Stax Library 2 series. So, um, you know, depending on what you, you know, you just got to go to Amazon and either look up Kathy Forti, F-O-R-T-I, and, and you'll you'll find it. Or you can go to the Trinfinity8.com website and, and or the Stax Library of Truth.com website and find that information as well. Well, I appreciate you being on the show. I, uh, um, I hope you uh, get some customers, uh, plenty of customers from, you know, the sh my show coming out. I'll post it on YouTube uh, as soon as we get done with it and send you a link. And I hope it helps you out. And I appreciate your time. Thanks, and Mike. It was a pleasure speaking with you. And uh, thank you again. And let well, me thanks, stop. Mike. And aloha and mahalo from Hawaii. <laughs> So we're, before I stop the recording, where you're on the main island or? Uh, uh, no, I'm on Maui. You're on Maui. Okay, so is how big is? Old how, Lemuria. How, I'm I'm back in Lemuria. <laughs> how is how is Mau, How big is Maui compared to the Big Island? Big. Um, it's 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 good size. I mean, Oahu, uh, uh, the island of Oahu, which is most people are familiar with, is pretty densely packed. It's not as packed as Maui. And uh, and Maui is one of the biggest outside of the big island of Hawaii, which is the biggest all in the chain. But, you know, it's each of those islands has a, to a different energy to it. So and uh, I like the energy of Maui. So is it like half the size of, of the big island? Approximately or a third or what? What do you think? Uh, you mean Maui compared to uh, the Big Island of Hawaii? Yes. Um, oh, I don't know. Maybe uh, a half to two thirds, something uh -huh. like. That. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. And and uh, how did you? How long have you been living there? Uh, it's about uh, a year and a half now. You know, I, I lived in Santa Monica, California, for many years. Then uh, briefly lived in Prescott, Arizona during during the uh, the pandemic, 
and uh, and then located to to Maui. But uh, but born and raised in Chicago, spent years in New York City as well, and so I've kind of Virginia Beach. I've I've kind of a little bit of gypsy in me. I've moved around and taken my practice into different places, and and so you never know where you're going to land up. So. How far are you from the uh, world's largest active volcano? Well, Haleaka is right, right behind us, and and that's not an active volcano. So uh, the active volcano is on the Big Island. I know, uh, Mauna Loa. So how far is that from you? Uh, you know, over the water. I don't know how many miles. <laughs> you got to go to another island for that. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, I don't know the distance between the islands, and I, no. you know, if that thing explodes, I'm just wondering how close you are to it. No, nah, it's never exploded that, you know, that far where it's. Uh, but you know, Haleakala is considered the heart chakra, you know, the heart of the earth, and uh, where Egypt is uh, the center, uh, Haleakala is the heart. So it's got it's got some pretty incredible energies, and I'm kind of right. It's right back up against me, so you know I I I can feel the energy of this this great mountain. It's uh it's quite something. Speaking of energy, uh, I got one or two more questions. So people talk about uh, spirits walking the Hawaii uh, at night. Have you heard? Do you know anything about that? Um. They call that the Menahuni, <laughs> little tiny men. They look like little dwarf spirits, you know. Are they? Uh, uh, well, I haven't seen any. I have friends who have seen, you know, and maybe it's because I'm usually not out walking at night. <laughs> but, um, but you know, I have with friends seen, you know, UFOs here. So, um, you know, they they come and buzz over the islands every now and then. Uh, but the people, there's no uh, malevolent or otherwise spirits that that people talk about frequently that walk the islands at night? Well, if they do, they haven't bothered me. Uh, you know, so um, that's all I'm concerned about right now. <laughs> okay, well, let me stop the recording. Here we go. Thank you again. Uh, oh, before we go, uh, tell the, uh, let's see, uh, what if we, is there anything we have, forgotten to say during this well uh, just Trinfinity. my websites trinfinity8.com ascension11.com um stacks library of truth.com and you know just look me up kathy forty on amazon and you'll find my books there as well so i thank you all for listening and uh, i uh, hope um, i hope i gave you enough to think about all right let me stop the recording now here we go